Hi everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. The Black Film Archive is a living register of black films, culturally significant cinema that you can stream at home, a window into our past that informs our present. Eddie Bailey sat down with the BFA's creator, Maya S. Cade. African American cinema has been a powerful tool to mold the image and tell the story of black people in the United States. The earliest recording of African Americans in a motion picture is from 1898's Something Good, Negro, Kiss. What if the history of black film has these gems that we didn't see, like this romantic embrace and how awe-inspiring it is to see these two actors embrace so tenderly? What I take from Something Good, Negro, Kiss is this idea that black film's past is a place of abundance. Maya Cade, an award-winning film archivist and scholar-in-residence at the Library of Congress, is the creator and curator of a nationally recognized online database of black films. We caught up with her at the Film Forum. My first memory of film, I feel like just being so in awe of this film, <laughs> Wizard of Oz. But shortly after seeing The Wizard of Oz, my mom was like, okay, you thought you liked this? Let me introduce you to The Wiz. And then that quickly became my favorite film. I think this idea of searching for home, I have to return to my family, no matter how far I go. I am from New Orleans, Louisiana. I love being from New Orleans. It's, it's one of the proudest facts of my life. Even though there's this idea of unlimited possibility in New Orleans, the actual access I have to making those possibilities a reality, it, it's a hard fight. And if I can move somewhere else, and it's, even it's a different hard fight, it's just is one that I'm around a community of people who kind of understand the vision of what I want to do. And to New Orleans, she may ultimately return. But right now, her yellow brick road has led her to where possibility thrives, her new home, Brooklyn, New York, where she has created the Black Film Archive. Black Film Archive began during the summer of protest in June 2020 and this moment where people were questioning how does blackness show up in the world. And in this moment, there was this really critical lens on black film. There were a lot of people saying, black film of the past has nothing for me. It's all racist. What's that? Must be them traveling menstrual boys got on in New Orleans. <laughs> Something I love about early films is that these black actors were given an inch and they gave us a mile. If I think about Gone with the Wind, we often talk about how limited that role was for Hattie McDaniels, but she gave us so much. She gave us, you know, nods to blackness that only black people could understood, and that's the genius of the performance. And I'm like, wait a minute, there is no place online people are going to, to like kind of understand black films. So what I started with was a Twitter thread and it had its moment. And one of my friends said to me, you know more than you're providing here. Why don't you give more? I'm like, okay. The first thing I knew was that this was built with black people in mind. Like the only people considered were black people. I was reading a book a day watching a lot of films a day, and eventually I arrived to a design I liked. Eventually I arrived to a format I liked of how the films looked on the page and how the films related to each other on the page. The films on Black Film Archive are accessible by embedding and linking to where they're hosted. So Black Film Archive doesn't currently host any films. It is really a repository where you can find black film streaming with cultural context that I'm writing. The Black Film Archive has many films to offer, like films from Oscar Micheaux, who is regarded as the first African-American to own and control a movie company, the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. Also featured on the site are the late Paul Robeson, Josephine Baker, Sidney Poitier, Ruby Dee, Spike Lee, Robert Townsend, and more. You can also find films that never went mainstream. And now, Black Film Archive has gathered a growing collection of international black films that are available to stream. Film is, is one of the easiest ways to understand history. It becomes the record of history for most people. So the future of Black Film Archive, 
is that you can change the cultural imagination of Americans, of people all over, when you present history to them. This is Eddie Bailey for Arts in the City. Speaking of cinema, Oscar season is in full swing. Our Neil Rosen has a preview of the major categories and what he thinks will win and what should win. It's time for the Academy Awards, and it's an eclectic mix of nominees vying for that coveted gold statue this year. So here's what I think will win and what I'm rooting for in some of the major categories. <laughs> Starting with Best Supporting Actor, this boils down to a two-man race. Kihi Kwan for Everything Everywhere All at Once and Brendan Gleeson for The Banshees of Inishirin. Both of these veteran actors have been around a long time, and both have never won before or even been nominated. Kwan, now in his 50s, was a child star, co-starring in Indiana Jones, while Gleeson has shown great range in many heralded films over the years. I think Kwan will win here, but I'm pulling for Gleeson. Okay. For Best Supporting Actress, all five nominees turn in great work, and any one of them could win in this category. An almost unrecognizable Jamie Lee Curtis is quite good as she deglamorized herself in everything, everywhere, all at once. It does not look good. That's true regarding her winning. The actress that I would like to see is Kerry Condon, who did an exceptional job in The Banshees of Inishirin and steals every scene she's in. But I believe the winner in this category will be Angela Bassett in the highly successful sequel, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Bassett was nominated once before in 1994 and didn't win. But win or lose this time, she makes history here as the first actor in a Marvel film to ever get an Oscar nomination. For Best Actress, the smart money is on Kate Blanchett to win for her starring role in Tar. Playing a celebrated composer who's also the conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic who faces a big downfall in her career, it's quite the performance. But hot on her heels is Michelle Yeoh who also has a great shot for her leading role in Everything Everywhere All at Once. I am really good. I'm sort of pulling for Yo here, but when it's all said and done, I do think that Blanchette will win. Thank you. For Best Actor, I think Brendan Fraser is practically a lock here for his work as a morbidly obese man in The Whale. Who would want me to be a part of their life? Apparently Oscar voters, who love a good comeback story. Fraser, who was once a big Hollywood star, but whose career hit the skids in recent years, wowed audiences for his work in The Whale. Frazier gives the best performance of his career, and combine that with the fact that historically, the Academy tends to vote for performances where actors radically change their appearance. Her aesthetics are really convincing, but Frazier's emotions and frustrations really come through, despite being buried under a fat suit. He will win, and I want him to. For Best Director, the odds are in favor of Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheiner, the pair who did everything everywhere all at once. If that movie gets caught up in a sweep, these guys will probably win. But we can't discount the Steven Spielberg factor. The legendary director has made a semi-autobiographical tale called The Fablements. And even though he's won Oscars before, he's so loved by the Academy that he might just pull off a surprise win. My prediction is the Daniels, as they've collectively come to be called, will win. But I'd like to see Steven Spielberg take home the gold. Which leads me to Best Picture, the big prize of the night. Here's what might happen here. My gut feeling is that everything everywhere all at once is going to win. It's a unique inventive film that deals with elements of sci-fi, alternate realities, drama, and a bit of absurdist comedy too. It's hard to make all those different things work well. And for that reason, I believe this surreal action-packed film will win Best Picture. As far as what I want to win Best Picture, the two movies I liked the best weren't even nominated, namely The Menu and Emily the Criminal. Sorry? So even though you won't hear much about either of them on Oscar night, you can still check them out as they're both streaming now. The 95th Academy Awards are on March 12th. Tune in and see how I did with my predictions and enjoy the show. For Arts in the City, I'm Neil Rosen. Next, we meet an art historian who is fighting for artists who don't get the attention they deserve. Donna Hanover introduces us to a City University professor who even got an artist's work accepted into the National Gallery. Art historian Gail Levin initially wanted to be an artist herself, but her parents worried about her future and objected. She grew up in Atlanta watching her mom paint as a hobby. She'd gone to art school, really an amateur painter. 
And as soon as I could walk, my mother, who was painting, got me to paint to keep me busy so I wouldn't bother her. And then when I went to college and wanted to become an artist, she was horrified. My parents said they would disown me if I became an artist. So I got the idea to become an art historian because I could also write. Gail became a curator, a professor at the City University of New York, and the author of more than 20 books about various artists. And thanks to her, the work of an artist who had been sidelined, Teresa Bernstein, recently had a huge success. The National Gallery now owns Teresa Bernstein's wonderful canvases, The Readers, from 1914, for which her father posed as one of the men, often immigrant men, reading at the New York Public Library and Easter Morning Polish Church from 1916 of parishioners at church to which her beloved housekeeper um, took her. This all started when Gail learned in 1985 that Bernstein was still painting at 95 years old. The two became friends, which was noted in the New York Times. Gail has curated the work of Edward Hopper at the Whitney and knew that Bernstein had long ago exhibited alongside him. She was amazing, like going to a time machine. Bernstein painted suffragettes, women in an unemployment office, immigrants and other scenes, as well as self-portraits. About 10 years after she died, Gail curated an exhibition of her work. And then Gail included her class of CUNY grad students in writing a book about Bernstein. I got some wonderful essays by my students and they are in the book. It was very exciting to um, have graduate students make their first publication. Gail considers it an important mission to draw attention to the work of women artists, especially those whose art has not gotten the consideration it deserves. She wrote the catalog for a recent showing of works by Lynn Drexler at the Barry Campbell Gallery. This is one of my favorite canvases by Lynn Drexler. It's from 1968. It's called Towards Twilight. And I just love her use of color. She has always an engaging palette. Her, her feel for shape and texture, it's just so evocative. Christine Berry, co-owner of the gallery, says Gail's research and writing about artists is brilliant. Anytime we can work with Gail, it's our honor. Really, first of all, it's her expertise. She's the expert on abstract expressionism, and that's our specialty at this gallery. Sometimes you read biographies and you think they're going to be a little dry. Gail finds a way to make every bit of the story interesting. She weaves it all together, and you can't wait to get to the next page. In her writings, Gail has focused on artists like Lee Krasner, Judy Chicago, Edward Hopper, and his artist wife, Joe Hopper, among others. And she didn't give up on making her own art. In spite of what your parents said, you actually did become an artist. Yes, I do work in ink and watercolor uh, and acrylic. I had a show of collages. One of my collages that I like most actually was stolen, but I've had a print made from it. Growing up in Georgia, we were called, told we were the Georgia peaches. And so I depicted myself with a peach head and a, the body is in part um, a Del Monte peach can. Well, when your art is stolen, it means somebody wanted it. So I have to take comfort from that. Gail is proud of the book on Teresa Bernstein, which was sponsored by collectors Martin and Edith Stein. When Martin died, Edith entrusted Gail to give more than 30 of their Bernstein paintings to museums around the country. That's why Lewison Stadium, for example, is in the Phillips Collection in Washington. Mending the Nets and Gloucester in Blue are in the Cape Ann Museum in Massachusetts. And the Readers and Polish Church Easter Morning are in the National Gallery. And that was my um, task or privilege, you could say. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City.
using art to understand disease. A professor at CUNY's Hunter College is combining dance with some very complicated science to help her students comprehend cancer. Here's Andrew Falzone. If you look through here, as a professor of biological sciences at Hunter College, you would expect to find Dr. Jill Barganetti in a setting much like this one, wearing a white coat in a lab on the front lines of the battle against breast cancer and the gene mutations that cause it. But when Barganetti conducts class in Hunter's black box theater, she's found another way to wage war on the disease. More potent than any cocktail of drugs, she's mixing science and the art of dance to educate Hunter's undergrads, the next generation of scientists. So it's a, a class on the books at CUNY called Choreographing Genomics. You can look it up in the course catalog. Very often there are a lot of concepts that students have difficulty um, understanding. And textbooks don't do a great job. Uh, and one of the ways that people learn is kinesthetically. And I have danced my entire life. After fleshing out the concept in her own mind for decades, Barganetti created choreographing genomics by fusing the lessons of genetic biology with postmodern dance, a branch of dance that considers all movements, even walking or breathing, as a form of dance. Layered on top of the fusion of science and dance is another art called choreo poem, which provides a poetic narration for the movements. How can you put a patent on something that our bodies invented? No. It's not there. Despite its roots in a non-traditional approach to science, the course is still rigorous. Students have so weekly readings assigned about both scenario, the genetics and the postmodern choreographers they're studying. There's a traditional written midterm exam, and half of the final is a research paper on a specific cancer gene encountered during the semester. The other half of the final is a performance of the choreography the students themselves created. Our cameras were there. I think they did a fantastic job. They learned so much, and for me to watch it all in one take, because they had never done it all together at one time, really allowed me to see how they could take the information and work with it on the fly. And after a semester's worth of work, the students found the experience incredibly rewarding. My advisor recommended to, it to me. He said, it's a really cool class. Um, I'm a freshman. So it was also one of the only ways that I could really get into like a more advanced science course that doesn't require prerequisites. And I was interested in seeing how I could dance to, you know, do science. Normally when we think of cells, we look at them under a microscope, we look at them in a textbook, but to actually embody the cell and embody the movements and the actions it goes through really put a new perspective on cell biology for me. What gives me the joy about the science and the dance together is that I've been thinking it maybe my entire life, but I didn't understand that I was thinking it. And I perhaps was embarrassed to express how I thought about it, because you always think you're different and your difference won't be appreciated. But now I understand that my difference is appreciated and I appreciate my difference and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, and I don't try to hide it. And so when I can feel proud of it and discuss it, I think it brings me great joy. Cancer I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. If you ever feel pretty mediocre in the kitchen, like I do, author Leanne Brown says we are not alone. Her cookbook, Good Enough, is full of recipes that will feed your body and your spirit. We chatted, we cooked, we ate. Spend some time with Leanne Brown and it might just change your idea of what it means to be a good cook. 
you say in the book that perfection is a liar, even in the kitchen. Uh, and Big time. The, there's no such a thing. Leanne's latest cookbook, Good Enough, is a collection of recipes and candid personal essays that approach food with a focus on mental health, a dose of self-care right at the kitchen counter. And so it's about trying your best and appreciating your best and that your best will change on different days. Yeah. Leanne explains Good Enough was born out of her own struggles following her first cookbook, Good and Cheap. She was overwhelmed and feeling unmotivated in the kitchen. One of the other things you said in the book that uh, I really related to was that you said sometimes you felt like a fraud about your own oh eating habits, gosh. like nuts over the sink, maybe some cold pizza for breakfast. All the time. I was making myself feel bad for eating nuts over the sink, but if I reframe that and go, how great is it that I like had some nuts over the sink even though I was so busy and tired? I fed my body. Wonderful. Right. Good job, me. You know, like, why can't we truly, like, yes. that is nothing to be ashamed of. That's a wonderful thing. And cold pizza for breakfast is delicious. So how does that attitude translate in the kitchen? With recipes that allow for plentiful substitutions and encourage enjoying the process. And for those of us who don't always read all the directions first, there is TLDR, too long, didn't read. Short summaries at the top of each recipe because, well, we've all been there. Everyone says about uh, about recipes, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, I know you're supposed to read it all the way through, but like I didn't. And, yeah. and then you are halfway <laughs> through and it's like, and rest overnight in the fridge. And you're like, no, like you're gonna have these <laughs> exactly. moments. Exactly, right? yes. Leanne showed me how to make her white bean chorizo and hearty green stew, a simple and delicious option for a chilly night and a chance to slow down and savor the moment. So I try to just not rush myself too much because we're always in a hurry in our daily lives. And then a learning opportunity for me with a fancy can opener. Oh my gosh, this is really gonna be mortifying that my portion of the demonstration has come up and I don't know how to open the can. I also spilled some of the beans, but in the spirit of embracing my many kitchen imperfections, we moved on and got our ingredients sizzling on the stove, added some greens, and within minutes, steaming bowls of stew. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. That Great. is so good. We made it together. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> You can see more of my interview with Leanne Brown on the next episode of Book It. Maybe you've heard of Patank. It's a little like bowling and a little like bocce, and it's catching on in the United States. Barry Mitchell found a spot in Brooklyn where you can play Patank seven days a week. A classic French game is gaining new fans in Brooklyn. Welcome to the Corot Club in Industry City. Petanque is a boule sport from the south of France. Boule sport is generally any game where you're kind of throwing something at another thing. Uh, <laughs> curling, shuffleboard, bocce. A lot of the boule sports are very similar. I think one similarity between uh, billiards and petanque is that when the balls hit each other, you get that nice cracking sound, which is very satisfying. Dana Bunker and Aaron Weeks opened the Corot Club in 2020 with four outdoor courts. And then just recently, we opened up our brand new indoor space behind me. We've got nine full courts inside, a full bar and a full kitchen, 6,000 square feet. So now we're operating indoors, outdoors year round. And there's a reason it's called the Corot Club. A Corot is when you hit your opponent's ball dead on and then your ball remains. Uh, most of the time when you're shooting out an opponent's ball, both balls go flying, but if you hit it just right and your sticks, then you have the point. Salut à tous, salut à tous. Petanque is a big deal around the world, especially in the south of France, where it was invented. These are the finals of the 2022 Coupe de France de Petanque. Petanque is a precision sport, which means it's not too strenuous athletically, but it requires a lot of hand-eye coordination in order to uh, achieve the goal. The goal is to throw the steel balls as close as possible to the target, a small, colorful ball. This here is our target ball. In Petanque, we call this the cochonnet, which means piglet in French. Now, anytime you throw the cochonnet or any of the boules, you have to have both feet inside the circle. So I'm gonna toss one out. No, I didn't do it. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so I want you some beer on me. 
The Corot Club is located in Industry City, a 100-year-old manufacturing complex on the waterfront in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Once known as Bush Terminal, the imposing, heavy industry structures have been modernized and repurposed for 21st century office, retail, dining, and recreational use. The 16 buildings of this sprawling campus also attract artists and creative types, while heated tents and furnished courtyards invite strolling and sitting. And you'd be surprised to hear that this is a huge destination over the weekend, not just in Brooklyn, but for people coming from Manhattan, from New Jersey, from all over the city. The teams get a little bit enthusiastic. It's a casual league, but some of the teams are a little serious about the casual play. Uh, we do have leagues every Monday and Tuesday nights. We've got about 120 league members uh, right now, and they play for about 10 weeks and then do a little finals. And after that, we have an award ceremony where we give out trophies. We have a lot of fun. We like to say that if you come down and play at the Corot Club, you get a little taste of the south of France in the south of Brooklyn. Corot Club Petanque in Industry City, Brooklyn. For more information, you can visit us online at www.corotclub.com. And check out our Instagram at Corot Club. Barry Mitchell, Arts in the City. That is our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We would love to hear from you. I'm Carol Ann Rudell. See you next time on Arts in the City.